This is the Dreamers Podcast, where dreamers share their stories to inspire you. Now, join host Joe Pardo as he interviews a dreamer who's living their dreams. Welcome to the Dreamers Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Pardo, and today I'm interviewing Matt Clickstein. Yeah, you're the first person to ever get it right. Are you, no, I'm not. Stop. You totally are. Everyone says Stein, even after I tell them it's Steen. I swear to God. You can listen to any of the other podcasts. It comes up every time. Does nobody listen to Bruce Springsteen? <laughs> I, I, well, he's also S-T-E-E-N, and I'm E-I-N. True. So it's Frankenstein, so you think normally Stein, you know, or Ben Stein, or... You know, so, eh, who knows? Anyway, go ahead. (laughs) Who was living his dream through writing, and he just recently wrote Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's golden age. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's so so great to have you here. Just a quick background about yourself. Grew up in Southern California, went to film school at USC, went and worked in film and television and journalism right out of school. Uh, got tired of that and left L.A. in 2008 after the economic collapse and the horrible Writers Guild strike that happened and ruined everyone's careers for a minute. Then I've just been moving around the last couple of years and working different jobs in different places like Portland and New York a lot and Boulder. You know, been doing just a lot of writing and filmmaking and TV stuff and whatever I can do to pay the bills and keep putting out the art. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what does writing mean to you? When you put... Words down on paper, that is writing. (laughs) No, expressing yourself, expressing an idea or ideal, expressing an ethos, uh, you know, just getting information across. I think the best way to describe writing uh, is right there in Stephen King's On Writing, which is one of his great books. Uh, where he is explaining uh, a rabbit and the rabbit is painted and the rabbit has a number on it and puts this image of this very specific rabbit in your head and says, that's what writing is. I just put an image in your head and I don't even know who you are. And you might be reading this 100 years from now. And I, I think that's a really, really good articulation of what writing is. Beethoven said something similar about music, which is, You know, music puts you in the mindset of the musician or the composer. And I think, you know, I think that that is what writing is. You know, my my greatest joy is having someone nod their head and go, wow, that is a good point. I love having my brain scratched and I love to scratch other people's brains. It's probably why I like to focus on nonfiction, both in what I write and what I tend to read. I really don't read a lot of fiction or even watch a lot of, I watch a lot of documentaries. I'm very interested in ideas and information. And I've always been that way, even since I was a kid. When I was in fifth and sixth grade, I'd read a lot of biographies and I'd read a lot of making ofs and was very interested in the way certain films were made, even again, as young as fifth or sixth grade. I thought Disneyland was cool as a kid, but I loved Universal Studios. I loved going to Universal Studios. I wanted to see how movies were made and go behind the scenes and that kind of thing, much more than just going on like a ride. Like I was real in, really into Universal Studios much more than Disneyland. So that I've always kind of been that way. So and that's now what I want to do to other people. I want to tickle their brain a little bit, poke it with a stick. <laughs> so, so what would you say inspires you? A little bit of everything. You know, I was actually just having a conversation with a slightly older kind of big brother-ish type in a good way, not the Orwell way. A friend of mine is sort of like a mentor. And I was just reminiscing about when I was in my early 20s, I was I was so productive and I wrote so many screenplays and made so many short films and wrote so many essays and such. And I look back on that and go, I don't understand how I wasn't more bored and lonely because, you know, I just was really focusing on my work and I wasn't thinking about girls and I wasn't going to bars and drinking with friends. And I was really like a, like an art nerd. Like I really did just do that for about a year or two, kind of how I was in film school too. I had my friends and I was social, but I really focused on my writing and my films in a way that I never probably will ever do again because I just now I like to hang out with friends and you know go after girls and I like to you know do social things which I've also learned helps my writing and my art I do feel it's one of the reasons why I move around a lot I like to meet people and talk with them and hear their stories and incorporate it into my work but I'm a social animal and I want to be a social animal 
you know, back then, I think I was much more influenced by the art itself. Now I'm influenced in the reception of that art. And I don't mean just like making stuff so I can get money and so I can get accolades. Those are great. And I need money to live. I'm not going to lie. But I'm very interested, like I kind of just said, in tickling people's brains and getting a response out of people. I like being provocative both in my life and in my artwork. So I'm inspired by others who do the same kind of thing with filmmaking and writing and music. It's one of the reasons why I really haven't cared too much for television the last few years because television doesn't really do that anymore. It's not really trying to. It's just commercial now, which is okay. I, mean, I just don't watch it. But I love great art that can bring those two things together. Like we were you know, talking about a little earlier, Paul Verhoeven, I think, did a good job of that with some of his movies. And James Cameron's done it pretty well in the past. And Sonic Youth, the band, is a big inspiration for me because they were able to bring together the art with the commerce in a way that was very unique and accessible and universal and yet tickled your brain a little bit and made people think. And I think that's really important. Terminator is a good example of that. Robocop is a good example of that. Pretty much everything Sonic Youth has ever put out or that Kim Gordon or Thorsten Moore puts out in any you know medium, artistic medium, does that, I think, really well. So. so how did writing come about for you? I think writers write. It's the same reason why I don't play music. I've been around with music in the past, certainly when I was a kid, you know, saxophone and clarinet and stuff like that. And I'm kind of trying to sort of get back into it now. I feel a little weird that I don't know how to play the guitar or piano and everyone else I know does, especially out here in Lawrence. Everyone's a musician, a filmmaker, an artist, et cetera. And it'd be nice to be able to communicate with them in that way and express myself in that way with them. So, but I'm, I've never been a musician because I don't make music. I've always been a writer because I write. I sit down and I write. I've never really experienced writer's block. I don't really understand what that would be like even. And I'm not just saying that in arrogance, although it is arrogant, that's fine. But I just I can't even like, you just sit down and you write and you're writing or sometimes I have to write. It's almost like sneezing or throwing up. And in fact, sometimes the work is very much like just vomit, but still it comes out. And I've always been that way ever since I was, I can remember, I just wrote, it was what I did. You know, I'm not really interested in sports or watching sports. I'm not really interested in video games. When I'm bored, when I'm nervous, when I'm scared, when I'm excited, I write. And it's just what I do. And I've been very extremely fortunate that especially over the last five years or so, I've been able to make my living almost entirely off of writing or things like writing, you know, or that is similar to that. And even before that, I was pretty much always made the bulk of my money off of writing or filmmaking, which tends to be for me a lot of writing type stuff. So it is screenwriting or doing work that's basically journalist type work when I'm doing work on documentaries and that kind of thing. So, so how was it received by your family when you told them that you wanted to be a filmmaker slash writer? My mom has always been extremely encouraging. My mom was also kind of, I don't even want to say an ex hippie. She still is kind of hippie ish. She told me when I was a baby, she used to whisper in my ear that you're going to be a rock star one day. She really wanted me to be a rock star. I think if anything, she might, she sometimes still brings it up. I think she's a little disappointed that I didn't become a rock star, but she's a big fan of my writing. She can be very critical too. I mean, she'll, there's stuff of mine I've written where she can't even read it because it's just like, she just doesn't think it's good or whatever it is. I think that was very helpful growing up with a mom like that. It was very supportive and encouraging, but was pretty honest. I mean, I went through a period where I didn't show her my stuff because I was worried about the criticism of it. But she's ultimately always been pretty supportive. My dad, on the other hand, not really. I, I don't want to say he's been discouraging, but he hasn't really been very encouraging. You know, I think everyone's dad wants you to either follow in their footsteps. He's a businessman or, yeah, become a businessman or especially when you're a little bit smarter, they expect you to become a doctor. They expect you to become a lawyer. I think my dad's still a little confused about why I never became a lawyer or a doctor. And I don't really think he understands why I've chosen to be a filmmaker, why I've chosen to be a writer. You know, for my dad, the only real accomplishment I've ever really shown is graduating from USC, which funnily enough, wasn't much of an accomplishment for me. We've actually had a lot of arguments over that. You know, for him, it was like the best thing I ever could have done. For me, it was a bit of a joke and a bit of a farce. And I don't really understand why he doesn't get more out of my having published books or created TV shows or the fact that I have been able to survive and fairly well for the last five or 10 years off of film and writing alone, which is not an easy task. But 
you know, it's the way that it is. It's the way that he is. And I can't begrudge him too much for it. But mom's been very encouraging. Dad, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> and how about when you told them that you were going to be a published author with, with Slime? Same, you know, really not much different. I, you know, I've had my moderate successes over the years. And I've kind of come to terms with the fact my dad and even his mom, my grandma, <laughs> You know, until I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and I have a house of my own and two cars and a family, I don't think that they're ever going to see what I'm doing is successful at all. I, I think I could even have a movie come out unless it's a blockbuster and wins an Academy Award. I don't really think that. And I've had a movie come. You know, I wrote a Steven Seagal movie. It's terrible and shitty, but, you know, it's a movie that came out. I don't really think they're ever going to see that as success. And my mom was extremely excited and extremely encouraging. What's funny is, and I'll wrap this up real quick, but what's funny is I think I get more out of my dad's not being encouraging than I do out of my mom's being encouraging. Because my mom, it almost seems fake after a while. It's like everything I do is amazing. I'm her little prince, you know. I'm like definitely a mama's boy. I've always been. And, you know, she cares so much for me and she's so protective of me and and that kind of a thing that it's like of course she's gonna love everything I do even though like I said she was a little critical of some of my work when I was younger but that was when I was still just learning how to talk but over the last few years she's just so incredibly encouraging that it almost is meaningless whereas my dad it's like I feel like it's good for me to have this goal of the day I can get my dad to respect something I've done I know that I've I've really made it in my own mind. Even, you know, so beyond the book selling and beyond the movies getting produced and anything, it's kind of fun to have this unattainable goal in the future, you know, that I'm I'm constantly striving for. Even when I was a kid and I knew I was smart, but I probably wasn't going to be going to Harvard for a number of reasons, I still used Harvard in my mind as this like unattainable goal so I would be like if I can just swim one more lap I'll go to Harvard if I can do this one thing I'm gonna get into Harvard if I keep going I'll get into Harvard and you know even after I got my SAT scores back and again started realizing junior senior of high school that I'm good but not Harvard good I still used that as just this thing of this burning light that I was always striving toward and I think that that was good you know, and I see that so too with my dad. I think it's good to have an, an unattainable goal. I don't think he'll ever fully respect what I do. And my God, talking about daddy issues now, I'm just talking on and on about this. But, you know, I think I think everyone has that kind of thing in their life. I think for a lot of people, especially young men, it is their dad. I think my relationship with him is not too different from a lot of young men, and especially young artistic creative men. You know, your dad wants you to be successful. He wants you to be a businessman. He wants you, you know, to make a living and have a house and have the cars. And, and you can't really always do that as a musician or writer or filmmaker, even when you are having some moderate success like I have been. What steps did you take to get started when you decided you wanted to write Slimed? That's a good question. I really had to learn a lot about Nickelodeon, way more than I ever thought I need, you know, could possibly know. You know, that was one of the fun turning points was when I realized that there really was a book there. And it wasn't just going to be a bunch of gossip and it wasn't just going to be a bunch of like silly little disconnected stories about episodes of this show and episodes of that show. I started learning what the history of Nickelodeon was in a way that I, you know, I, I had some interest in that as a younger person. Like I said, I've always been in nonfiction, but I really started reading a lot of these articles. And there were two scholastic books, two academic texts about Nickelodeon one called um, Nickelodeon Nation that a professor named Heather Hendershot put together. It's basically a series. It is a series of scholarly essays about Nickelodeon. And the second book, Kids Rule, is by one of the authors of the essays in the first book, just expanded it into a full book. So, you know, I read through those and I, you know, started talking with more and more Nickelodeon people. And after a while, I started really understanding what Nickelodeon was. I, I learned who Jerry Laybourne was and started finding out about Jerry Laybourne. And, you know, she was this kind of name that everyone kept bringing up. And at first, I wasn't really sure exactly who she was. And then I started realizing, like, God, everyone brings this lady up. I better find out who the hell she is. And then when I learned and started finding out more about her, it's like, oh, no wonder. Like, she was Nickelodeon. Like, that was really fun, too. As I've described it to people, like, it was basically like having a million-piece puzzle and not having the picture. So as I was putting the puzzle together, I was learning what the picture was. And one of the reasons I had to do that is because I only had about six months for the most part to put the book together. So I had to go really, really fast. You know, I can go into some of the logistics of selling the thing and, and getting it to, to Penguin and whatnot. You know, it's the same, you know, how do you fall in love? You know, just how do you meet your wife? How do you know what you want to do when you get, you know, it's different for everybody. 
I, the best and most concise answer, because I know we don't have a lot of time, is great moment in Thank You for Smoking, where the kid asks his dad, had he become a lobbyist? And he goes, you just figure it out. And I'm sorry to say it, but that's if you want to sell a book or I would imagine anything like that, or it, I do know, like filmmaking or TV show, how do you sell a TV show? How do you sell a screenplay? You just do it. I have friends out here who keep asking me, I'm in Lawrence, Kansas right now, how do you move to LA? How do you move to New York? And I say there's only one difference between the people who move to LA and New York and the people who don't. And that is some people move to LA and New York and some people don't. And it seems like aphoristic and silly and cloying and cliche. I'm like, oh, you know, like Tony Robbins. But I think people tend to forget like that really is the answer. You know, how do you move to New York? You just do it and you just go and you don't worry about how you're going to get a job. You don't worry about how you're going to get a place and you've got to figure it out. And it's got to be individual for every single different person. The story of how I sold my Nickelodeon book is nothing like the story of how other people sold their books at all. So to pretend like I know how to sell a book is silly. You know, it's just, you just, you figure it out. You make it work, you make it happen. So I'm not going to ask you what your favorite Nickelodeon show is, but I will ask you, what was your favorite Nick at Night show? Ooh, that's a really good question. I like that. Hmm. I, you know, what? what always comes to mind, just because I think it's really, really obscure and I've never heard anyone ever talk about it before. And I kind of got a little bit of a kick out of watching it as a kid, knowing that no one else knew what the hell it was. But there's this weird show called Topper. And it was always on at like five in the morning or some bullshit. Do you remember Topper? No. Do you even know what it is? No one knows what Topper is. I think they made it into a movie at some point. I think they've been trying to make it into a movie. But it's this guy who lives in this house and it's basically Beetlejuice. It's this guy who lives in this house and the ghosts of the couple who lived there and died are still in the house. And it's, you know, your typical I dream of genie or whatever, where it's like a normal guy's life. And he has this weird little surreal thing going on where his roommates are more or less are this ghost couple. And it's just this really weird, funny show. And I don't know. I really enjoyed it. I will say that, Nick at Night was a big reason why I loved Nickelodeon as a younger person because I loved watching stuff in black and white and I loved watching old comedy. One of the first books I ever read that was like an adult book was the autobiography of George Burns. I mean, I was write, writing the Phyllis Diller as a like 11 year old. Everyone else was writing a Wayne Gretzky or Michael Jordan or whatever. And I was writing a Phyllis Diller. Most people our age today probably still don't even know who Phyllis Diller is. So I was I really loved watching the older stuff. I was really into that as a kid. My mom raised me on the Twilight Zone. And so for me, black and white was kind of cool. And uh, I loved watching Nick at Night. And I loved watching Dennis the Menace. I mean, come on, watching him run around and break things and whatnot was so fun. I was never really that into Lassie. I thought Lassie was kind of dumb. And Mr. Ed was fun. I can't remember if Beverly Hillbillies was on Nick at Night or not. But I like that now. Just really quick, there is an old show that definitely was not on Nick at Night but called My Living Doll that Julie Newmar, who was the who was Catwoman on the TV show, one of the Catwomen on the TV show, um, was on with this old comic named Bob Cummings. And uh, it was like Small Wonder, but for adults. And it was it also sort of like I Dream of Jeannie, where <laughs> Julie Newmar plays like this robot woman who's basically like the Vicky from Small Wonder, but she's a woman. And he has to like pretend like she's not a robot. And so it's sort of the I Dream of Jeannie thing. And funnily enough, it was created by the same guy who created, or was one of the main producers of Small Wonder, also uh, My Favorite Martian. But it is the most sexist show I've ever seen. I can't believe something like that ever existed. It's early 60s, and the whole thing is just like teaching her how to be a woman. <laughs> but from the mindset of like 1960s man, you know, or early 60s, <laughs> no, so the late 1950s, if you will. And it's, oh man, I've been watching it a lot right now. I got it from the library. I was like, what the hell is this? And it is it is amazing how sexist it is. It's an amazing show. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so uh, real quick, is there any last thoughts you'd like to share? I don't know. I, you know, buy the book. Tell your friends about it. Uh, you know, we worked really, really hard on it. Uh, you know, I'm very proud of it. And I think there's a lot of really good information there, not just for people who watch Nickelodeon or are fans of Nickelodeon from that era, but also just people who are interested in how 
art comes together, TV shows come together, how something like Nickelodeon happened, why it happened, what it was like to be there at the time, how things changed over time, how some of what they were doing with design elements and music and such affected a lot of what happened later on in television, film and art. It's, it's a fun book. It's an easy read and do me and your community a favor, buy it from your local bookstore. If they don't have it, tell them to get some copies. I'm rel- relatively happy with what Amazon has done, not so much lately, but for the most part. And, you know, that's great, you know, ebooks and all that stuff, but, you know, buy the book, you know, it, support your local bookstore, show it off to friends. It's a great cover, read it on the train so people see it. They'll, they'll strike up a conversation about old Nickelodeon, you'll make a friend. I was just thinking of Sherman from the critic, buy my book. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jay Sherman. Yeah. <laughs> buy my book. Buy my book. Buy my book. <laughs> You know that Judd Apatow wrote, wrote for that show? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the biggest fan of that guy either, but that shows. I mean, he also wrote Heavyweight, so that's a fun movie. It can, how can people uh, connect with you? What websites and Twitters and all that? www.slimedthebook.com, facebook.com forward slash Nick Oral History. We're also on Twitter at Nick Oral History. We have a really big, awesome event coming up through the New York Comic Con uh, they're doing a new thing called Super Week, which is basically a week long of 75 different events happening all over the city, including the Comic-Con itself. It's basically going to be like South by Southwest, but of Manhattan. It's going to be huge. We're doing a big thing on October 9th at the Hammerstein Ballroom, 2,200 seats. Polaris is going to play basically only the second time they've ever played live. They're going to do a couple of small little shows just to warm up, but nothing close to New York. We made sure of that. And so they're going to be playing the band from Pete and Pete. The guys from Doug who did the music for Doug are going to be playing, which is awesome. Watching them do their shit live is amazing. That will be the second time they've ever done that live. The first time was at our our launch event last year. Uh, We're going to have a celebrity panel. I'm not saying who's coming, but people can probably guess. And then the guys from Pete and Pete, uh, Mike and Danny, are going to be doing a live podcast. And they're also bringing some special guests. And they have a a really cool thing that they're going to be kind of wrapping up the whole event with at the end. Um, So you can get your tickets on Ticketmaster. It's called Nickelodeon Night of Nostalgia. Go to the Facebook page. Everything's there. Forward slash Nick Oral History. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then we're actually going to be doing some small, really tiny little events through the Jewish Book Council. I'm going to be going to some different Jewish book fairs all over the country and just kind of talking about the book and that kind of thing. St. Louis, San Diego, Washington, D.C., a few different places. So that should be sort of fun in the months to follow. We have the new book coming out in 2016. It's about nerds and misfit empowerment is what we're calling it, how it's changing. And there's a Tumblr for that now called Oh Shit, Now I Have to Write a Book. And it's actually chronicling the day-to-day fears and ups and downs and successes and whatnot of putting an actual book together. And I think it's going to be kind of cool to sort of chronicle that, you know, right up until the book is out and selling and whatnot. So you'll really get all the, my nightmares and my worries and how it works. And for anyone who is wondering how a book comes together, that's going to be the Tumblr to follow. Oh shit. Now I have to write a book dot tumblr.com or however the hell that url works i'm just getting started on tumblr so i don't know but yep awesome well thank you very much for coming on the show matt i really appreciate it and i hope people really find what you had to say interesting because it was hilarious <laughs> I, hope so. I thought we talked for long enough <laughs> uh i'd love to have you on the show again at some time if, if sure. you have me you know like a year or so and follow up on how you've been terrific all right joe thank you very much thank you for joining us for this episode of the dreamers podcast Follow us on Twitter at Dreamers Podcast. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dreamers Podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the Dreamers Podcast, please send an email to j at jpar.co. This podcast is copyright 2014 by jpar.co.